Good evening. Welcome to um, our Must See Monday. This is one of my favorite times of the year where we do a uh, Must See Monday on visual journalism. Um, our guest tonight is Kenny Irby, who is Senior Faculty and Director of Community Relations and um, Diversity at the Pointer Institute in St. Petersburg, Florida. I think most of you by this time have heard of the Pointer Institute, but it's really their premier um, uh, educational institute for working journalists, to keep journalists informed and trained. Um, he is an important figure in visual journalism education, known for his knowledge of photographic storytelling, innovative management ideas, and I like this one, steadfast ethical thinking. The founder of Pointer's photo journalism program, uh, Kenny teaches in seminars and consults in areas of photojournalism, leadership, ethics, and diversity, and he also leads a program for middle minority um, high school, is it middle school, middle school um, minority male youth. During his 19 years at the Pointer Institute, he has traveled to Russia, South Africa, Singapore, Jamaica, and Denmark, preaching excellence in photojournalism and truth-telling. He chaired the 2007 Pulitzer Prize photography categories and is a founding member of the National Press Photographers Association Best of Photojournalism Committee. He also has served as photo manager at two Olympic Games, chaired the Unity 99 Visual Task Force, and served as a speaker and faculty member at the Eddie Adams Workshop. Before going to Pointer, Kenny was a photo editor at Newsday where he contributed to three Pulitzer Prize winning projects. And before that, he was a photographer and assistant photo editor at the Oakland Press. And it's not Oakland in California, it's in Michigan. Uh, he holds a bachelor's degree in photojournalism from Boston University. And just don't tell anybody else, it's a secret between us, but he was a classmate of Dean Callahan's. Um, Dean Callahan said he was the well-behaved one. Um, and he is a multi, and he was, is a multicultural management fellow at the University of Missouri. Was, he's a recipient of numerous NPPA awards, including the 1999 Joseph Costa Award for Outstanding Initiative, Leadership, and Service in Photojournalism, and the 2002 President's Award. Before we welcome uh, Mr. Irby. I do want to point out the hashtag that we're using tonight. Megan said a few people were using different hashtags. Uh, please use this one so we can all follow you. And please welcome Kenny Irby. Thank you, thank you. All right, get the hashtag right, all right? Okay, so it is my privilege and pleasure to be with you tonight. Um, and I'm going to walk a little bit. I'm going to move a little bit. Um, how many of you are here for the extra credit? I just want to make sure I know. Extra credit, all right, good, good. It's okay. Let's give the extra credit folk a hand tonight. Come on. <laughs> they need extra credit, so they need some extra applause, too, uh, as we go forward here. So tonight, um, you know, my, go my goal is to uh, uh, be on a place where I'm often I find myself out on the edge. Um, and being on the cutting edge means you bleed a lot. Um, you go through a lot of anxiety. You go through some struggles. And um, the reason that I'm really, I was really excited about this opportunity um, was because I knew, because I've been here for Must See Monday before, I knew that there would be uh, a large number of young people uh, and early adopters, innovators, people who want to uh, do the best uh, to try new things uh, and to, uh, uh, to push the envelope. How many envelope pushers here? Anybody, anybody? Because you know, if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always gotten. And so if you want to do something different, you have to step out and try some new things. So um, can I get somebody to go to the screen? We can go to presentation mode. Oh, there we go, bingo. Um, so how many of you are intimidated by this image? You know, this rig. Um, you know, is that photography? Uh, people ask that question all the time. Um, is that what I have to do to be a hybrid camera user? No. Um, the camera that I have with me tonight, it's, now don't get, don't, I'm just going to give you some, this is a practical must-see Monday. Um, this is a Canon 5D Mark III. 
uh, S. It's, uh, you know, every, the cameras that have the S's on them are just a new prototype. And what's really interesting is, is that this package has continued to evolve and develop. I'm holding about five grand in my hand, um, you know, and, uh, oops, no. yeah, you know. Um, so th this, is, this is where you would start um, if you wanted to be a hybrid camera user. Um, now, your dean put this piece on. Now, Chris Callahan, I'm gonna tell you, yeah, we went to school together, and he was, he was a real nice guy. Um, he, was, he was a real innovator. He was one of the people, I was the picture editor when he was the editor, um, and we collaborated on a number of projects. Um, and so you have leaders in your, in your faculty, and I really enjoyed the day. Uh, a lot of the pushback and some challenges. I actually had somebody in one of the classes challenge me on my bow tie. I said, now look, I don't care what nobody else think, because I'm, I'm an innovator. I like to be out on the edge. Um, and so, I'm sorry? Classy bow tie. Classy bow tie, thank you. Give that man, young man some more extra credit. <laughs> All right, more extra credit. Um, so we're going to jump into the presentation. I wanted to be relaxed. We're going to have more than enough time to answer your questions. I've got about 40 minutes of presentation, some video to show you, um, not canned stuff that's on my hard drive, but stuff's on the web so that you can follow the links. Um, and you can hit me up at Irbyman at Twitter. You're welcome to tweet, follow the hashtag, share your comments. Just don't go to sleep because I'll call you out. I just wanted you to know that. All right, so um, HDSLR, we've been talking about this for a long time. What does it mean? Um, I've had about 25 years of, of my own personal experience. Uh, one of my good friends, Nick, Nick, is in the audience. Wave, wave at Nick. Nick. Nick, wave your hand. All right, he's a, he's a multimedia journalist here at the, uh, at the Arizona Republic, um, and he can tell you, he'll heckle me if I do anything that's out of line. If I tell any unethical things, or if I say anything about him, he's going to make a noise. Um, but what I want to do is talk across difference, um, because many people in the room have been uh, experienced with traditional 35 millimeter SLR cameras. Uh, and the only historical reference that I want to share with you, and I was talking about this at dinner tonight, um, photojournalists have always been in a period of adaptation and early adopters of new technology. Um, from the large format, uh, 35 millimeter to 35 millimeter, to from black and white film to color transparencies, from color transparencies, color negative, from color negative to digitals, from available light to flash photography. So there's always been this uh, concept of adapting. And now, um, if you believe the, the reality, there's some people who think you can do equivalent great photojournalism with a small device like this. Um, that's all I want to say about that. I'm leaving that alone. Uh, we're going to talk about being honest, um, because there's a bridge here that's really important to make tonight of bridging uh, diversity and change and early adaptation uh, to be early adopters to the new technology. So you've got to be honest. You have to ask some questions. Um, you're going to have to do some research. If you put that camera, if I put that camera in your hand, you would you would not know where to start immediately, but with a little coaching, a little teaching, um, you could do excellent work with uh, a hybrid camera. Um, a lot of folks in the professional world from both sides, from the broadcast and the still world, see it as an anomaly that they don't want to do anything about it. And I'm going to leave that for a moment, but uh, you need to challenge with passion. Uh, and don't let your passion become poisonous. Now, I'm a still photographer. There's some people out there still using film but their images are not being used in media, immediate media consumption on a daily basis. So there's a place, there's a distinction if you want to do high art photography, but if you want to do journalistic work, um, it's digital and there's no doubt about it. And increasingly, I would tell you today that if you're going to work for any major metropolitan newspaper in America or in the UK uh, or in the West, this is the reality. If you're going to work for Getty, if you aspire to be a hotshot conflict zone photographer, you're going to be working with uh, a DVSLR ca camera because that is the reality. So your passion needs to be put in perspective. So certainly some people need to be willing to change, and that's why I'm really excited to talk to young people because you haven't gotten yourself mired in the muck and the clay of what used to happen. You're, uh, you're willing, look, Nick's laughing over there. He was one of those people, oh, that's not photography, Kenny. No, yes, it is. 
It's a new kind of photography. It's even, uh, it brings new opportunities. And you have to stay in a conversation. If you're gonna learn, you have to learn from the people around you. You have to expose yourself. This is not Hunter S. Thompson photography where you're working in a, as, a, as a lone person in a silo. Um, you do have to draw upon other people to help you in the process. So one of the things I want you to think about is how still photography moves. And the work that I'm showing you is all work that has moved from this idea of moving from the decisive moment. Let me hear you say decisive moment. Say it like, it's, give me some passion, the decisive moment. The decisive moment. Okay, so the decisive moment now in the world, you, that's old and busted. Most of you are not interested in still photography in isolation from video, which is the extended moment. Say extended moment. Okay, so Brian Storm was here, and I'm sure he talked to you a little bit about that, how you move from still photography to full motion video, and at the end of the day, um, there's a place for both. Um, so there's a, there's a young photographer that I, who I'm really proud of, one of my former students, uh, Denise Keenan, uh, at the Indianapolis Star, and all she works with is a, a hybrid camera. And she loves it because it allows her to do stuff like this. Where's my audio? Yeah. Let's try that again. So the idea is that audio and movement um, now is possible through uh, a single lens reflex camera that operates Excuse me one second. Does that have anything with the resolution change you made? Because it's coming up. Sorry for the technical difficulty. Um, we'll get the audio here because video um, without, um, without uh, television, without audio is what? I mean, te television without still photographs or moving photographs is radio, right? Um, and we're not doing this for NPR. We're talking about how. Uh, but NPR has one of the most prominent new websites that uh, we can check out. Uh, so we'll go back, and I'll get back. I'll come back to that, I promise you. Or my presentation uh, is going to be a flop because there's lots of video to be considered. But the idea you saw to move from the still um, to the decisive moment allows you to see not the individual in an isolated place, um, but to move that, that information forward. So on the simple feature stories, uh, the technology is being used. Just uh, this last week, um, Nicole um, Sebecki actually in, the, uh, in Nairobi last weekend, uh, these photographs, um, her work uh, was documented uh, because she's primarily a videographer. Um, and so the freeze frame moment, the capacity for this camera to produce quality high definition still photography as well as full motion video um, is really important. So when you look at these moments um, and you see them or you engage them in the full frame reality, um, you wanna try it again? Okay, we'll go back. Um, I'm just gonna move forward, I'll come back. Um, the idea of uh, using AFP, using frame grabs, what some might call video frozen mo uh, moments from high definition uh, video is a reality because at the end of the day, nobody out there is looking and you're not talking to your neighbor going, do you think that's film? Or was that a video picture? Well, you know, how did they make that picture? What you are engaged in and what you are interested in as a consumer of information is the quality and the fidelity uh, of the information. And so when you see moments that are frozen uh, that then have the capacity to move into uh, full motion and give you the sense of, of immediacy and urgency, that's what video does, where still photography gives you the sense of uh, um, impact 
uh, an energy that may come from, a, from, a, from a, an experience of a decisive moment. And so when I, when I think about the kind of work that happens with these cameras, uh, here's a project that I had uh, the great uh, opportunity to spend some time in uh, actually uh, looking at last year was this project from the, um, the RNC when it was in uh, Tampa last summer. And one of the things that happened was they created a new interface where there was full motion video on what was happening outside that was chronologically synced with what was happening inside in the, uh, in the arena. And I think, again, that's some really interesting work, uh, an interesting way of thinking about how photography is practiced uh, in the new space. So let me, uh, let me jump into the web and show you that real quick. Um, the idea of how uh, photography is being practiced in the RNC and uh, uh, video, and this is where the, the audio better work or I'm in trouble. Um, this was a really interesting project that um, got a lot of attention, and we're still not getting audio. So this might be a challenge for you to just see how video gives you a different dimension in terms of the experience where you see these contrasting uh, experiences. This is what's happening inside the stadium. Uh, this is what's happening outside. And it's all time lapse synced. Um, so you, as a viewer, are being able to engage and see and witness everything as it, uh, as it undertakes, uh, as, you under, as you engage in what's happening in both places. So you can be in two places at once, but you can't do, uh, you used to do with a diptych, uh, which when you put two still photographs together, but now doing this in a video frame uh, gives you a whole nother uh, experience. So let me move you back into uh, the idea of how this, these stories move in still photographs. Um, when you look at a story and you're able to see uh, MediaStorm, which is another website that is probably doing the most innovative work that you can engage in uh, and see on the internet today. Um, I, was just, I just spent uh, a week in Dumbo uh, Brooklyn with Brian Storm and his team as they uh, offered a workshop called the Methodology Workshop. And you can see how uh, they have an enterprise of 12 people um, who work in this area using uh, three primary areas of, of understanding, the uh, publications, their clients, and their training, um, all stems from a video format. Um, they document with this camera, and this is their low-level camera. They're using the, the C500, uh, which is the highest resolution. They're moving towards 4K, um, where the quality of the video is, it far exceeds anything that a newspaper or website in and of its own uh, use would need because they're moving towards broadband uh, and cable distribution. Uh, and here, another, another situation where the still photograph is documented from um, uh, a freeze frame. It's a frozen frame grabbed from the video uh, to produce the still photography. Uh, so I know that the audio still isn't playing. So that's a, a short-term deficit that uh, I hope our IT folks will still work us through. Um, but the idea of this is actually fortuitous because this camera is a cinematic camera. And that's one of the things that you have to get your arms around in order to use a hybrid camera is that you have to take some extra steps uh, to overcome the shortcomings with audio. Now, I didn't plan that, but that is the reality um, that I'm faced with when you start to think about innovation. So innovation requires that you uh, move beyond what has been done. You take the, take the position that what you're going to do with your technology and your form of distribution is going to be unique from anything that has been done before. Why? Because there's never been a camera quite like this. There's never been a tool 
um, that the historic journalists who had come before, uh, now Sam Abel, who's a great photojournalist for National Geographic, and if anybody in here wants to study great still photography, um, he's one of the pe people that I would recommend that you look at his work in National Geographic and uh, the anthologies of MPPA and World Press. Um, and he makes it very clear that he, all of his images are not in a digital space. Um, and that if he had a tool like this, he can imagine what's possible. But because his career is, has, 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 he's in retirement, his career has gone before him, um, he doesn't feel like he has to be an early adopter to a piece of technology like this. Now, I'm not doing that. Um, so let me, uh, let me step away here. The, um, the, the, the reality is, is that the tool, um, the strongest tool you have is not the one that's in your hand, it's the one that's in your head. That's your brain. How you approach um, the difficulty or the challenge in the technology is really what's going to uh, allow you to either be successful um, or to be a failure. And I don't want anybody to see themselves as a failure, so I want you to think about really pushing beyond. And what you want to do is extend your voice. And your voice should get louder and louder to a point where you want to bring more voices and more understanding to a broader audience. And with a new technology, with a camera like this, you can do this. So I want you to go away from this session, regardless of what any technical difficulties, and see the capacity to be victorious in what you do. And so what that requires is that you understand that there are new variables. The new variables that, that are before you, new opportunities that are before you, and for you to uh, seize the moment to have a real experience of carpe diem, you have to really, you ha you're going to have to work with a camera like this. Um, we live in a full motion video world and things are moving so fast that you have to be able to provide for your consumers what they want and be able to give them the value add and for still photography um, is that value add. Because when you look at a still photograph, you have time to examine it and appreciate uh, the experience in ways that you don't do with a video, because video is ephemeral, it's fleeting, it goes by quickly. Sure, you can TiVo it, you can play it back, um, but you have to understand that your opinion is no match for the experience of the consumer. The consumer, um, you have to identify with and understand and then work forward to know that yes, you have an opinion and your, opin your opinion values, but at the end of the day, you know if you go in the store and uh, there's a different price on a product that the consumer is always right, right? So um, the consumers are right in the work that we do. So here's the thing. Everybody's not like you. Um, and so you don't produce content and you don't document for yourself. You're presenting for uh, an audience that you're thoughtful about. A couple of things with this camera that you need to understand to be able to, to manage it and to be victorious and overcome whatever shortcomings is one, that the, ergonomic, the economics are really important. Nikon and Canon are both in vigorous pursuit of your investment. Um, and largely, that's because of the lenses. Now you can use, uh, if you have really cool aesthetics um, and compositional approach that you like in your 35 millimeter camera, think about being able to document and produce video with that same aesthetic uh, or look, Canon is the same. Um, so the economics and the price point, here's another big thing. In American media and in mainstream media around the world now, increasingly, the company names the tune of what kind of equipment you like. Um, so if you're going to be successful as a young person, you can't say, oh, I don't like Nikon, I want to use Canon. Um, because what they'll say is, thank you very much, we've got another 60 people in line who, 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 who use whatever they give you. Um, or the other option you don't want to hear about, that means the other option is you would have to provide your own equipment. Um, now, as college students who are just finishing up and looking forward to uh, paying back the loans, uh, I don't think anybody here wants to take out another loan because you want to get a car. That's what your loan want to be in. You don't want to take out a loan for equipment and gear um, if you don't have to. The other issue is ergonomics. The feel uh, and the dynamic of this camera, this is still 
a 35 millimeter single lens reflex camera that has the capacity to document both still photography and full motion video. It's gonna be a test at the end, so make sure you remember that. That's what the camera does. The camera actually um, is a multi-purpose camera. Um, and so you're documenting here uh, in this position with a strap around your neck or some way to brace the camera. So if I was documenting this room, I didn't have a tripod, I still need to brace the camera because you don't want jagged, jerky video. Um, and so you have to think about, those are the kind of things that you think about as strategies to overcome what might be shortcomings. Now, so look at this. And I was upstairs in your studio um, after the, the news package today, and you know, I, I went out for the review, and some of you were, were there, and it was great. What happens is, because of the shortcomings of the cameras, there's a whole boutique market of uh, building what are called rigs ways to retrofit a camera um, similar to this to, to be able to do the things that a video camera would do. So for example, they're, they're called Frankenstein rigs um, because you're, you're trying to take a camera, you're trying to take this device um, and then jazz it up, um, add, you know, and every one, and watch this, every one of these features, uh, an auxiliary screen, a battery pack, a rig to stabilize, all that's extra money that's being paid to, to allow the camera to do some of the kind of things that you want. Now this is a, this is a link um, where you can see they, they, get, they get even more intricate um, and interesting as you go through. Um, and each one of these rigs is another fifteen two thousand dollars $2,000 um, in just the rigging. Uh, so, if you're independently wealthy, um, or you got a sugar daddy or a sugar mama, somebody giving you some extra money, um, that might be the way to go, but uh, I don't think uh, that uh, is it necessary um, or a viable solution right now um, as you go forward. Here's what's most important. The, other, the third big E is effectiveness. Um, if you're thinking about intimacy, alert, 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 if you're thinking about intimacy and getting close to people and being in places where folks are not intimidated by lots of gear and riggings, this is a wonderful tool to allow you to get into places that have been seldom seen and rarely heard about. Um, so here's a big alert. This is not a video camera. It's a cinematic, it's a 35 millimeter single lens with a cinematic mode. The video out of this camera is amazing. The video out of this camera is uh, quality cameras like this are used in Hollywood. Um, Iron Man 2 um, was, and Iron Man 3, most of the special scenes were used with these cameras that were in remote positions and uh, the, the video was broadcast back to the main station and the camera blew up and nobody cared about it. Um, that's how special and how prominent the equipment is. It is, as I say here, it, it has cinematic quality video, um, and I, if, I really hope this video, I, I hope this works this time. Anybody praying people, faithful people out there, <laughs> help a brother out, because um, this, this is, here's a piece by um, Alan Spearman, um, who's a friend of mine at the Commercial Appeal, uh, he won an award this year for this piece in, uh, uh, about Memphis poverty, um, and this package is, uh, is a profound example of what this camera can do and will do. Fingers crossed. Video loading. Um, and what Alan says, Alan sees himself as much as an independent filmmaker today um, as he does see himself as a documentary videographer. And so this is hybrid storytelling happening with a new kind of camera. So you see the video um, that's moving. Uh, you see, uh, and this is a big file, so it, it needs to cache a little bit. Um, but I need you to use your imagination. You're visualizing the possibility. Um, 
I guarantee you that the audio is as compelling as the, uh, as the still photographs and the full motion video um, as it goes forward. The, the thing that's most prominent with video um, is that you have a cinematic view. Let me try this again, start it again, just so that you can at least see the video. Um, the experiences that Alan documents here in Memphis uh, in the life of this young man are experiences, the camera placement and positions, uh, the production values are things that one person couldn't do. It would take a huge team of people to do that he was able to do because of the access uh, and the intimacy that he was able to develop uh, with this family. Um, Okay, um, give me, so let me pause right here just for a moment so that you can see the quality of the video and the shallow depth of field where everything in the background is blown out and just the primary uh, subject matter in the foreground. Those are things that you can't do easily with a traditional video camera that's set for uh, a high depth of field where everything is gonna be in focus. And so that kind of creative uh, manipulation that, that you, can, you can document with these cameras uh, is really quite special uh, for us to consider. So as I'm moving down the home stretch without video, and you, I hope you're getting the idea, there are some huge pluses with the technology. Um, the video quality, the intimacy, and the lens usage um, are, they've taken control again. Um, those, are, those are things that I can't, um, I can't overemphasize the value in the age of the internet where you're presenting storytelling, not just for an ink on paper traditional print publication, but remember a publication that has video um, that is gonna be consumed as some of you around here are looking on your laptops, on your tablets, uh, on, your, um, on your mobile devices because you get to consume. I don't get to determine how you consume my information. I just need to be able to present it in a place where it's gonna have impact uh, moving forward. Now, um, they're running video on another screen because they've grabbed they my stuck video. In the storm drain. People would walk past me for days and leave me down there. And I would see and hear everything. I would see people selling and buying drugs, folks fighting, hookers, hustlers, street life. My hands and arms would just be sticking out and nobody would help me. I can't pull myself out on my own. People just keep walking past me like I don't exist. I shouldn't be here. I died when I was two. He said I died when I was two. Um, and so this is not the kind of video you're used to seeing uh, your mama and your daddy didn't watch that kind of video on their websites when they first looked at video. This is the kind of video that you, that is compelling and you now have an expectation to see in every device that you consume information. And this camera can allow you to, 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 preside, to provide that. Uh, the, the minuses though. I wouldn't be worth my salt if I came and tell you all the good stuff and then you bought one of these and then you're like, oh, Mr. Irby didn't tell me this. Okay, so uh, audio is a challenge. You have to be deliberate and intentional about how you overcome that audio. Uh, and so supplemental audio uh, devices, this camera has SLR jacks you can plug in, um, audio you can plug in, a directional shotgun mic, you can add um, peripherals that will help you overcome because the little mic that's in the camera, remember, this is not a video camera. Let me hear you say that. This is not a video camera. All right, it's not a video camera. I wanna make sure you get that down. It documents video, but that's not its primary purpose, right? 
you can add, you can overcome. All of you who are in the broadcast department, you know about having, uh, I'm wearing a wireless lavalier. You can use that. You have to be intentional and purposeful in how you gather that audio. Um, but the camera, because of the R&D and the workshops that we've done and the commitment of the camera manufacturers to overcome to the best of their abilities, they do these things. Now, the autofocusing um, is another shortcoming. Um, you have to be intentional about rack focusing. Um, you have to think about how you're going to focus, where, how you're going to uh, frame a shot uh, or a composition. Um, and you always have to think about stabilization. Uh, the age of MTV is long gone. I hope it never comes back. Um, but we're not looking at, you know, jaggy Blair Witch photography and video. We're talking about photography um, that's purposeful, uh, and so stabilizing. This is a great stabilization strategy. Um, the other thing that we do to stabilize is we use what uh, people call sticks. Um, not a tripod, but a monopod. Um, and a monopod that will allow you to brace the camera. So there's simple solutions that allow you to, come, to overcome uh, and see across difference in a major way. Um, I had two other videos that I was gonna share with you to, to, to see some examples. Um, and so must see, um, yeah, it's called must see Monday, not must hear Monday. How about that, right? Y'all didn't like that, y'all didn't like that. All right, so, um, so the idea is um, Boston Globe did a package that got more interest. Now, Boston Globe does a series called uh, The Big Picture. Um, and um, this was a story uh, last summer, um, just quiet in spring, um, that actually, uh, it was about shootings that went on in the community. And the video was powerful. We're going to try it again, and we, we don't think we're going to have video, audio out of here. All right. Um, because this is a really good example of a still photographer working on a news story that he was given a whole day to produce and did a, a quick turn, a daily turn, like the broadcasters are used to doing, uh, the Nick now does on an everyday basis. And I can turn to Nick, I'm glad Nick's here tonight, because they have merged their newsroom where the still photography group and the broadcast photo department are sharing and working across purposes uh, integrated in their storytelling, right? Um, so what do you call yourself today? Are you a still photographer or are you a multi, what, what do you call yourself, Nick? Multimedia journalist, all right? So. Okay, so um, here's a story again. It's a live story. Um, photographers, the shooting was the night before. This is the next morning. Photographers sent out with a DVSLR, actually a 5D Mark II, so it's one generation before this um, to tell this story. That's it. Any other Harry Potter books of M500 Geneva Avenue on? Because you know the streets of Boston, you know they're dangerous. You know what I'm saying? Protection. Mm -hmm. Keep it on me. This has more violence in it, more violence than any neighborhood I've worked in before. They all know someone who's been shot. Um, but in the opening, as, as it starts again, um, you can see that still photographers have a real acute eye to details. Um, and so this is a wonderful tool in making a transition not to produce traditional broadcast video, 
but an opportunity to do something new and different. And it's even a greater opportunity when it's in the hands of a young person who's not jaded by what everybody else used to do. And your new purpose here, your guide and principle, is to present compelling, authentic video reporting. Um, so I actually feel, feel that when I see videos being produced by young people who are not encumbered by the tradition, um, but are really pushing the technology to do something new, um, again, still rooted in some you know, important basics, um, some video basics. And this is a, this is a video, a link um, that I use when I teach DVSLR to you know, show you how the menus are driven and how so much of this, you don't have to go to school, but Canon has made a commitment, much like the, uh, the Apple centers where you can go and you can see the technology. And this guy, uh, Chucky Luzier, who I use as an example, who is the voiceover for this package, he's one of those people who will bend over backwards to make sure you have what you need in your university. The, as I bring this to a close, and we can take some, uh, have some conversation about possibilities and ways that you're thinking about this, social media requires a tool like this. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, the Navy Yard, whether, you know, the, the, the spontaneous breaking news stories that come forward, there is a great need and demand for immediate video storytelling. Um, somebody tweeted the day um, in the first class, the first session that I was in, and I said, there's never enough time. Um, and that's never been truer because we're in the age of the always on and the 24 hour news cycle. And not only are we competing against other, uh, God bless you, other broadcast and journalistic entities, but we're competing against citizens in the fifth estate, people who have their cameras, um, who are out there and they're tweeting and they're uplinking and they're, and they're posting. So whether it's Twitter or whether it's Facebook, whether it's Storify, whether it's LinkedIn or any of the other um, social networking issues uh, and uh, alternatives out there, whether it's Instagram, which, you know, I'm not an Instagram hater, but I'm just saying if you've got a really powerful image, um, don't post it on Instagram because you are giving away your copyright um, the moment that you post it. Um, so you need to be more discriminating about what work you're, you know, all those pictures, cheese, you know, that's not real photography, that's Snapchat stuff. Um, put that on Instagram, but if you get something that you think has some value, you want to preserve that um, for yourself and use it in, a, in another format. So you can reach me, let's talk next steps, let's talk solutions. Um, you can reach me, Irby Man, at Twitter, Irby Man at Facebook, Irby Man at LinkedIn, Irby Man at Pointer.org. Uh, and I do apologize that the audio wasn't there, but maybe uh, it's for a major reason because you got the video impact and so you were able to consume uh, and see and visualize the possibilities. But I know you have a few questions and we're right at that time. That's perfect timing. All right, so questions, thoughts. I can sing and I can dance if I need to, but, but I believe you probably got some good questions. Uh, I just want to ask you what your opinion is on like um, uh, new cameras coming out like the Black Magic Pocket. Would you recommend that kind of camera to someone who wants to do multimedia journalism, you know, uh, like videography as well as, as still photography, something like the Black Magic Pocket, things like that that are coming out? Like what's your opinion on that? Well, there, there are lots of things that are coming out and um, if you're an early adopter on that technology, I'd say push it, try it. Um, you know, this is not the only solution. Certainly Canon and Nikon both have high definition uh, um, uh, DVSLR cameras or what's the, the term de jour, the term today is HDSLR because that's really what this is. It's a high definition um, uh, single lens reflex camera and that's what SLR stands for. Um, Pocket Magic, some of the new flip cameras um, are still at the lower end of the spectrum. And then there's, again, there's a red camera of 4K that are cameras that are way above this that, you know, price point is up to you. Um, here's what I tell folks all the time. When I went to NPR three years ago, um, I used a, a G10 to teach the NPR audio reporters basic photography. I teach young 
kids, 12 to 14, still photography principles for iPhones and iPods, right? If you understand the, cons the, the basic principles of composition and you understand light and then you understand journalistic responsibility and human nature, I don't care what device you use. Um, I, I made this my reference because I know that in the academy, this is the teaching point that the bridge... <laughs> The bridge that we're working on, um, something is happening back there. The bridge that we're working on is actually to bridge um, reflective practitioners with practical scholarship. So what's happening in the universities um, will allow young people like yourself to be able to go into the industry um, and hit, both, hit the ground with, beef, um, with both feet and to move on and, and, and push the industry. So, uh, you know, that kind of tool and an iPhone would work well at the Chicago Sun-Times because uh, they got rid of all their staff photographers and gave, them, and gave writers video cameras. Um, USA Today, uh, the New York Times, Washington Post, most of your major news organizations have now moved to DBSLR. What are you guys using now, Nick? Same. Okay, so. All right. Uh, hi. Yeah. Hi there. This is a uh, bit convoluted. Um, this has to do with the uh, picture that was shown earlier of the uh, uh, sort of lower class neighborhood with the older gentleman sitting in the rocking chair, you know, kind of with that look on his face, you know, like I've tried everything I can do for this community. Um, that format with the picture with the tagline underneath, um, that's been around on the internet for quite some time. It's, you know, referred to as a meme. Um, I'm wondering how valid those kinds of things can be in modern journalism. Because, you know, like you can see it as a funny kind of thing, like you see a picture of a bunch of sheep and one of them's black and you, the tagline is a black sheep is still a sheep. You know, that kind of thing, it can drive a point home very hard with just a simple image and reading one thing. And with things accelerating as they are, you know, not everybody is gonna sit down and watch a video. Not everybody's gonna sit down and, you know, read a story, read an article. Do you think that that maybe is where, thing, where, where things are going, how things will progress, if that's part of it, if that's just nothing? Well, I think, the, I think your point is well taken on the front end. Um, the expectation is, look, people would, media companies wouldn't be in, investing in the technology and demanding. See, they're not asking that staffers do videos. They're demanding it because um, there's, a, that is, there's two things. There's statistics and analytics that demonstrate that people watch lots of videos, consume lots of videos there. Um, and so it's not an, exor an exercise in futility. It is purposeful. Um, the, the idea and the expectation is, is that if you put quality before an audience that people are going to j dig deeper and they're going to go that one, they're going to go that next click to either read the full narrative um, or to, to look at the video and uh, maybe even look at a short video or a photo gallery. Um, and yes, the master narrative on the entry screen is really important. The combination of the photograph and the typography or the headline uh, uh, does make a statement and I think you're right to the extent that we have to be much more thoughtful about that pairing of words and pictures uh, and be more thoughtful about uh, how accurate um, a representation that would be. Um, here's the key. Video is just one of the new areas uh, in story structures that are really taking off on the internet. Um, uh, data visualization and uh, motion graphics is huge. People spend lots of time. If you watch Snowfall, uh, if you haven't seen that, the New York Times uh, package, um, with different forms of delivery um, in HTML. And the new HTML structures allows you uh, to present new, new story structures and new levels of information, be it. And, and the new things, and not just, as we talked about in one of the earlier classes, not just image or visual presentations, but new forms of dealing with the written word, um, shorter writing, um, uh, and, and, and more uh, video and audio interspersed into the HTML so that selectivity is in the hands of the viewer. So you kind of create your narrative path. 
uh, and it's up to the journalists and the producers to make it engaging and accessible. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Ken Hi, I'm Kennedy. I'm a freshman here at ASU, and I'm just wondering how would you advise or what next steps would you give a novice journalist to, um, so that they can develop um, with the new information that we've learned? How, what next steps would you give us to pursue developing and continuing in this industry? Well. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. I think one of the things you have to understand is that you limit your options um, when at this point you try to specialize. Um, there's no room for the single skilled journalists in the new multimedia world. So you have to have a secondary skill set, even, even better to be a triple threat. Um, and so one of the things I, I think it's really important for you is to, is to go through a self-assessment process um, with your instructors and your counselors to say, you know, what, what am I really good at right now um, that I should continue to work on? And then how can I complement that skill set? So for every writer in the room, a strong basic sense of still photography is a great secondary area. To be able to do portraiture, get close to people, uh, to document still lifes, things that won't move because that will allow you to present a level of photographic reportage um, in another organization that will help you go there. So it's an individual basis. If, you, if you're really good at still photography, then you definitely need to start thinking about audio. How do I do, why is audio on my brain right now? Anybody, you gotta be able to think about audio um, because stills combined with audio makes a easier transition to video. Um, that's the misnomer, the misconception that a lot of people have is that, oh, I'm a good photographer, still photographer, so I'll do video, it's easy. Not so. Video, when you're talking about movement and you're thinking about sequences and transitions um, to do it effectively, uh, the only thing that's really uh, a part of the standard um, building block is you still see light the same way. Um, and you still see compositions pretty much the same way, but then there's a whole nother layer of audio that goes with video, as you saw here tonight, um, that really helps. It's not absolutely essential, but it helps. Um, and then the idea of sequencing and packaging. So what I would encourage you to do is, again, first do that, let me just re review, is do the self-assessment, um, and where you're strong, continue to push yourself in that area and add you know, maybe each year would be a great way, is that in your sophomore year, you're gonna add another dimension, and in your junior year, you're really gonna uh, focus on video, and then by your senior year, you're starting to put it all together, uh, and that will help you build a well-rounded portfolio and package. All right, come on, two or three. Oh, she can't have a mic. I can, just once in a while. Okay, so what really interests me is that the kind of video that you're showing is what you see being done really well on the web in some instances. Uh, today I saw the New York Times, uh, the horse racing piece, mm -hmm. with, where they're doing stop, you know, they're stopping the image and doing slow motion and all these cin cinematographic uh, techniques. But where I don't see this is in broadcast television. Yeah. And, and I don't know, I mean, maybe it just doesn't belong in broadcast television, or do you see the kind of uh, video being used on television broadcast news changing? Um, yeah, all my broadcast brother and sister in the room, here's the reality. Broadcast is so formulaic um, to, to, to produce the packages. Um, uh, as I, as I uh, sat in on the production uh, today, um, you know, it struck me that um, you have to have leaders who are willing to take risks to do those kinds of things. Um, and as, and, and you, I don't see it in the broadcast world. Um, and so many folks have said, look, broadcast is gonna do broadcast the way broadcast has done it. Um, and see, cable is a place where you see folks taking greater experimentation. Um, I think it's short-sighted um, by the broadcast entities to stay 
with that very traditional 1970s approach to storytelling. Um, when the new audience has an expectation of something different. They want to be challenged. They want to be surprised. Um, and I don't know about you, but when I watch network television, I'm not expecting any surprises, um, with, with a few exceptions. 60 Minutes now does some, you know, on a Sunday evening will do some uh, stuff. Um, I do really like the fact that uh, CNN has been doing some different things uh, and on big projects um, on national, uh, I mean, uh, natural disasters, uh, you know, you will see like the fires um, in uh, Northern California and then the, uh, th in the floods in Colorado. You see on news packages some risk taking being done with some of the coverage in those areas, but the, the general, you know, news spots, that's not being touched. Um, and again, my personal opinion is, is that that's really short-sighted. Um, and the other thing that you need to understand that goes in to close proximity and understanding is that viewership um, of broadcast uh, news is on the same spiral that um, circulation is in print news, in newspapers. Um, so something needs to change to try to rekindle interest in, in those products. All right. So look, I'm not going to beat a dead horse. If you guys are done with your good questions, um, nobody else has a question that you want to ask, I bid you adieu. I wish you well. And please do reach out, uh, send me an email, ask a question, and I'll be sure to get back to you. Thank you very much. <laughs>